Amen. Leviticus chapter 6 in verse 12. Leviticus chapter 6 in verse 12. Leviticus chapter 6 in verse 12. And I'm talking about experiencing spiritual renewal and personal encounter. How to experience spiritual renewal and personal encounter. So, I remember when I got born again. When I got born again, I got born again very young. I was in a boarding school. What I, what I really remembered was this. When it came to, maybe like, it's, school was like three months. By the second month after half term, I would begin to struggle. Normally, when we get to school, the first week, everybody's on fire. They're praying. This is in the, in the, prim, in the secondary school. Everybody's on fire and praying. By the time it gets to the second month, you know, they're about, then the fire begins to go down. And I was very worried. The reason why is that I would just notice I've lost my passion for prayer. I've lost my passion for Bible study. And the reason why that happens is that it's the pace of life. Sometimes it's just life. And the reason I'm saying so today is this. Some of you are here and um, you've lost your passion for the things of God. You want to be honest? You're not as passionate as you were about prayer. Some months or some years ago, people would define you as someone that can pray. But now, you've grown out of that place where we can call you prayerful. Some years ago, you were always onto one Christian book or the other message. You were very, very into it. But right now, you're just coasting. You're just coasting. Some of you just feel really, really drained. And you're just wondering, what's happening to me? As a matter of fact, if you're not careful, you, you kind of want to prefer going to church online than coming physically. And the reason why is that you've just lost your passion. You, it's not just what it used to be for you. There was a time you used to really so get into prayer. You were so passionate in prayer. You were so passionate in worship. But right now, when you worship the Lord, it's dry. And all of this shows that you need spiritual renewal. There's some people that just you just feel drained. You just feel drained. You're very, you're very agitated. Every small thing gets to you. You're so impatient right now. And all that is calling for is that you need spiritual renewal. Let me give you a good example here. This is a very good example here. You need to pray for my voice. Yeah, because you can tell we've been having a lot of prayer sessions. So, it's telling on my voice. Because my press is coming. Ooh. <laughs> Praise God. Yeah. So, you, you, need to just, you need to just really walk at that. Experiencing spiritual renewal and encounters. Experiencing spiritual renewal and encounter. Sometimes it's a fact that your heart is filled with so much fear. Sometimes your heart is just filled with so much fear. So let's read this together. Leviticus chapter 6 in verse 12. Glory to God. The Bible says it. I'll read. Thank you. Bible says, and the fire upon the altar shall be burning in it. Now, the altar, now, now let me say this quickly. Everybody look up here. I want to correct something. People say, I came to the altar and this is the altar. First of all, this is not an altar compared to what the Bible calls an altar. The altar in the Old Testament was bloody because it was on the altar one part of the altar, they used to slaughter the animals. And the second thing is that, you know, and, and you know, the altar, was, the altar was a place where God met man. The altar was a place where, where God met man. The altar in the Old Testament was a physical location. In the New Testament, the altar is no longer a place. The altar has become a person. Are you getting me? The altar is now a person. So, you can't say, I'm coming to the altar. This is a stage. You are the altar now. Why? God has met man inside you. Let me give an example. You must understand, most of you do not realize this, that there's a difference between the Old Testament thinking and the New Testament thinking. And unfortunately, even a lot of pastors do not understand it. So, they carry Old Testament thinking into New Testament. I'll give you an example. So when Jesus Christ died, the Bible says something happened. That the curtain in the temple was turned from top to bottom. Yes or no? You know the story? Have you asked yourself what's the significance? The significance is this. In the Old Testament, that curtain meant the access to God was blocked. 
so when the curtain was turned what it was saying to us in the new testament that is the curtain the access to god is now what open so in the old testament watch this now now many of you did not understand why daniel prayed and opened his windows and got arrested you thought he was being an hypocrite it was not being an hypocrite the deal was this god was god was not with them their connection to god was the temple of was the temple so anytime they had to go and pray god was in the temple they could not just pray in their house god was in the temple so they will go to the temple where god's presence was and pray and god will answer their prayers but if for any reason they couldn't go to the temple there was a provision that anywhere they are they would get up and face the direction of the temple like the muslims like the muslims will always face as in mecca yes he said they will face the direction of the temple and they will pray and if they face the direction of the temple it will be as if god has accepted their prayers so when daniel was going to pray he opened his window and faced jerusalem that was why he was arrested because he was praying and he couldn't pray privately but the question is this why did they have to face jerusalem they had to face it because it was their the temple was their connection to god because god stayed in the temple that's why in john chapter 4 the woman asked jesus christ he said the jews says we must worship in what in the temple he said the gentile says we must worship in this mountain jesus now told her what it is he says from this moment either the mountain or what or the or the temple would not matter again they that must worship he said god has been seeking true worshipers oh my god you know bible says god has been seeking true worshiper praise and worship leaders tell us that god is seeking people that will worship in him in spirit and in truth mm -mm. it's true worshipers that have the capacity to worship him in spirit and in truth what he was saying is this the time has come we are not going to a temple we are not going to a mountain we have become the temple of god so paul says it this way in first corinthians he said don't you know that you are now the temple of god so if the altar was in the temple where is the altar today the altar is in me if i oh once i kneel down to pray in my house the temple has come alive hallelujah you don't have to come to church to pray he, listen you don't have to look for something on the stage you know sir you have become the temple of the lord hallelujah what makes it a temple the god lives in there hallelujah you know just like some of you are from these places where there are shrines what makes it a shrine the idol they worship lives inside that place what makes it a temple the one you worship lives inside you i'm not the temple of god i'm a mobile shrine praise god i'm a mobile temple praise god i'm a mobile shrine praise god if someone say i will deal with you say i feel sorry for you why because the one on the inside of me is greater than he that's in the world praise god you know here someone says on you know you know say how can they allow someone come to the altar? what is the altar they say they allowed someone come on the altar what do you know is the altar you're speaking based on ignorance old testament talk and thinking this is an auditorium so, so, but god is here god is not here because it's a church as we came we brought him as we came we brought him some of you the churches we attended before they were using a, a warehouse you're using a retreat eating an event center the night before what happened that investor that they were grinding they were drinking uh palozo give me one champagne now give me one name what green court and the people don't know that green court give me give me what they were drinking as soup they were drinking there even when you came that morning you could still smell the alcohol in the air but all of a sudden the pastor said gather your hands together all of a sudden despite the smell the praise of god filled the place the usher fell under the power the alcohol was still smelling there was still stain on the rug because the hall is not the church no sir we are the temple of the holy ghost we are the temple of the holy ghost praise god so where is the altar the altar is in me and the temple of god the altar is in the temple i both the altar and the temple is inside me 
So on the altar, we offer sacrifices. How do we offer sacrifices? Every time we lift up our torrents, the Bible says we're offering sacrifices. The reason why is it, I'm challenging you to think in the New Testament way. Don't let people scare you and make you afraid and make you feel God is like this. No. Glory to God. I said, Glory to God. So let's go back to the scripture. So the Bible says that when the Bible says the fire upon the altar, the question is, is it a physical altar or is it talking about you? Who is he talking about? You. He said, The fire in your spirit must keep burning. That's what I'm going to. He said, the fire in your spirit. Listen to me. If you're not careful, everything wants to kill that fire. He said, the fire in your spirit must keep burning. The question is this. Is the fire in your spirit burning? Or the fire in spirit is dying? He said, the fire on sharp are you. The fire in your spirit must keep burning. The question, I want to ask you, why are you so afraid of the future? Because the fire is not burning. Why is your prayer life so weak? Because the fire is not burning. Why are you always falling to depression? Because the fire is not burning. Why is your life not filled with assurance? Because the fire is not burning. And see what it says. Number one, it says it's God's work to light the fire, but it's your work to keep the fire burning. If you have lost your fire, you remember that you are the one that has to keep the fire burning. See what it says. And the fire upon the altar shall be burning in it. It shall not be put out. He said, the fire on the altar shall be burning. It shall not be put out. What would the priest do? You are the priest. The priest will burn wood on it every morning. Every morning when we wake up, we are putting wood. The problem is that you expect to keep burning, but you don't want to put wood. Because putting wood takes some amount of work. You expect to keep burning, but you don't want to put wood. Every morning, Every morning, the word, the prayer, the word, the prayer, the word, the prayer. And what happens is that you will just notice. You will just notice that the fire in your spirit will be growing. Let me say something to you. You cannot be a strong Christian without a consistent prayer life. And you cannot have a consistent prayer life. His prayer is not built into calendar and habits. You can't be. If you pray when you feel like praying, you will never pray. You will never pray. The people that go to gym, when they feel like going to the gym, they never lose weight. The people that really, gym makes a difference. They are a discipline of going to the gym. You will hear, I go four times in a week. When you see people that prayer makes a difference, they have a routine around prayer. They have a routine. The question, do you have a routine around prayer? Or you pray when you feel like? When you don't feel like, oh wow, I'm not in the prayer mood today. No, you, 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 you move yourself to the prayer mood. First of all, go back to the message I taught on Wednesday. I taught a very great message on prayer on Wednesday. Very challenging. So he says the fire on the altar must keep burning. So if you want to express renewal, you must have, you must give yourself to devotion. You must give yourself to devotion. Glory to God. I said glory to God. I said glory to God. I said glory to God. Why is it important to have an encounter? And I'm going to say this here. Why is it important to have an encounter? God uses encounter to expand our thinking. So we may say God uses encounter. To expand my thinking, I'll give an example. Jesus Christ turned the five loaves, I'm sorry, took the five loaves and two fishes and made it feed multitudes. Then later on, in you know, some months, some months later, um, he told the disciples, he said, Be careful of the leaving of the Pharisee. And one disciple now said, Oh wow. He said that to us because there is no bread. When Jesus Christ heard it, he was very upset. And this is what he said. This is what he said. He said, in my par- paraphrase, he said, you think I'm upset because there's no bread? He said, didn't your mind go back to when we didn't have bread and we fed 5,000 people and there was leftover? What was Jesus Christ saying here? Please pay attention. Don't lose this. This is very powerful. What Jesus Christ was saying here is this. When you have an encounter, a miracle, 
it's not just about what I did. I'm showing you what I can do in other circumstances. My expectation is that that miracle will expand your mentality so that I can do more in your life. Let me give you what, what that means. I want to give you a practical example. So you went and you went for the application and you're rejected. And you come back and you say, Father, I thank you because you are in charge. Your girlfriend says, you are very stupid. Instead of you to be crying, you are thanking God. You say, no, I cannot cry. You remember, you remember, tell her, when I got admission to university, you didn't know the full story. The story is that they had closed admission and I thought I couldn't get it. Somehow, God made a way. They extended for two weeks. My mother made contact with someone. Long and short, I got the admission. The same thing happened with my first job. They said that they were no longer recruiting. All of a sudden, the person they recruited dropped out. And that's how I got my first job. What are you telling the person? You are saying that I've seen too much to think that God can deny me. That is what an encounter does. I've seen too much to think that God can deny me. A lady in this church, they had a problem with their health. The husband had a problem with their health. She came to see me and said, Pastor, I'm getting tired. I'm praying. I wanted to encourage her. He said, Pastor, thank you for encouraging me. But let me tell you the truth. I cannot say that God does not do miracle. He said, the things that happened in my life. He said, I had this health condition. God healed me. My husband had this. God healed me. This happened. God healed me. What I cannot understand is why this one is taking long. He said that God will do it. He has done too much for me to say he will not do it. He said, but I just, he said, I'm just in this phase where I just need that miracle right now. The reason why she could say that was because she had had encounters. What encounters does for you is that it gives you a reference point. Oh my God. Are you getting me? Are you getting me? There's a principle I thought some weeks ago. It's called the principle of the first. What's the principle of the first? And the principle of the first applies to firstborn. Most of the time, if the firstborn can get it right, the, the younger wants to follow. What's the principle of the first? This principle of the first. So please watch it down. This is the principle of the first. If in your life, you can have one testimony of what God has done, that's it. You know why? Whatever happens to you, there's a reference point. I know this because when I was seven, I had, um, I had a condition, allergy, adenitis, and some other condition. And I used to drain blood from my nose. Blood would just drain from my nose. And I got born again, they, you know, and by the time I was 12, they were trying to operate my nose. And my mom's friend, my mom's friend is late. If you, you know, my mom's friend is late anyway. And she went for a NASA surgery and they forgot cutting wool in her nose. The same doctors I would do my own. One day she was sneezing, she sneezed out, and the thing came out. So my mom became very afraid and paranoid. I said, I should not go and do the surgery. So one day my mom told me at 13, he said, you're always praying and saying, Jesus can do it. Can't you pray to God to heal you? And that was my challenge. I went to God in prayer. I prayed. Supernaturally, the blood that drains from my nose dried up. When I get into situations, that are difficult. I remember that the Lord that did that, what did I know at 13 years old? What kind of prayer was I praying? Because I have a reference point. Some of you here, can I be honest with you? The reason why you can't believe for a miracle is simply this. You have never seen what God has done before. Either in your life or in the life of other people. And that's the truth. If you want to be honest, you, you just hear that God, they say God can do something. You have never seen what he has done before. Pastor G was there in the other service and I remember one time Pastor G, he had a toe problem. His toe was outgrowing his legs. So it's a very terrible thing because your toe will start cutting your legs and he had this big wound. So I now said, uh -uh, what's wrong with your leg? He stopped wearing shoes, they're wearing slippers. So you will notice it. I said, what's wrong with your leg? He said that my toe is going. I said, what's the solution? He said, the doctor said all they have to do is to cut the toe and deaden it doesn't grow again and that's fine. I said, so do it. He said, no, 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 no. He said, Pastor, I don't want to do it. I said, why? He said, what will I say I use my faith for? Are you seeing something? He said, I want God to do this for me so that I will have a reference. This is not terminal. He said, I will have a reference. Long and short, first month, second month, it became sticky, smelling. 
One day, I just looked at him and I said, ah, you're wearing shoes. He said, even if I did not realize. He said, I just woke up one day, the tone had gone back, the leg was already healed. He said, it's not the miracle for me, but I've proven the power of God in my life. Can I tell you something? That's where many of you need to be. You need to get the problem, and let me tell you what the problem is. This is why people say God does not answer their prayers. They've not learned to test the power of God in small things. It's when big things want, they want to apply the power of God. If you are not used to working just when there's small things, you might not know how to master it in big things. So you have not used the power of God to overcome headache. You have not used the power of God to overcome, uh, what do they call it, wound. It's not when doctors say there's cancer or PCOS. You will not say, oh God of heaven. It's not as if God cannot answer, but you have not exercised that faith consistently. So God's power is available, but your faith has not been exercised. So your faith is not strong. Praise God. Every time you need 200,000, you go. They will give you. You go. They will give you. You go. They will give you. The day you need 200 million, you will not know how to ask the father. The reason why is that every time you need help, you have developed human crutches to help you walk. What you need to do is this. And that's why sometimes in God's orchestration, some disappointment will come. And God will use the disappointment to strengthen you. Sometimes you will learn this, that the no from human being can be a blessing from heaven. Because until human beings turn you down, you'll never know how to look up to God. And some of you, the reason why you're stuck is this. Instead of you to let go of those you're holding their apron, you don't want to let go because you're asking yourself, if I let go, who else? And God is saying, let go, let me catch you. Scripture says, when my father and my mother forsook me, then the Lord picks me up. He said, the year King Gozia died, he said, I saw the Lord until some things die in your life. You can't see some things. Are you here? Are you here? The challenge is not that God is not working. You've not learned how to use your faith in small things. You've not learned how to use your faith to get a hundred thousand error, two hundred thousand error. So when your house rent comes, two point five million, you come under pressure. Listen to me. No matter how how desperate you are, you're going to need time to learn how to use your faith. So everyone needs an encounter. Why? An encounter helps to expand your mind. You know, there's a there's a guy on the mainland church. His name is Jomiloju. Jomiloju, I prayed for him when he was about five or six years old. Can you remember the story? Five or six years old, and six years old. It was six years. How old is he right now? About eighteen. He's about eighteen right now. His mother attends church. He was six years old. He was born with an eye defect. So by the time he was two or three, he started using glasses. His glasses, by the time he was four years, was as thick as the bottom of a coke bottle. His parents were told ahead of time and they said, eventually he's going to lose his eyes because he was born with a defect. We were in church that day and I said, in the, I said that people should bring children that had, what they call it, def, that, um, malfunctions in their body. The mother brought him. I laid hands on the child. I said, and this thing. The next day, as we were going to school, he told the mother, why are you giving my glasses? I've received my healing. The mother said, not that I didn't believe, but I didn't want him to have a faith crisis that he will now not see or the teacher will now call me and say, where is the glasses? I will not know what to explain. He said, they got to school. Ladies and gentlemen, teacher did not call. He came back home. Day one, day two, day three. He perfectly healed. The boy did the testimony on one of my birthdays. He said, when I saw what God did in my life, one of my desires was to be a pastor. That God will use me to do this for somebody else that kind of child, what university will he go to? That you will not argue that God is not, God is not alive. The reason why is that, by the time you finish proving scientifically with your formulas that God is not alive, he will say, excuse me, what I've tasted, what I've handled, what I've seen. Let me tell you what you need. You need to say what I've tasted, what I've seen, what you've handled. The reason why you are shaking, you are shaking, hey, I'm not married, I'm not married, hey, I will not get a job, I'm not get a job, hey, I have sickness, I will not have a child. It's because you don't have an encounter. If you have an encounter, the thing will open up. Praise God. The thing will open up. The Bible says that Elijah told his servant, go, take this rod, put it upon the dead child. The guy went three times. The child did not get up. 
Elisha got up himself to go. Elisha said, if there's something I know about God's power, this child must come back alive. You need an encounter, brother, for real. Forget the fact that you have money, you need an encounter. Because there are things that money will not solve. There are dimensions of human life that either you know people or not, it will not touch. You need an encounter that you can tell that the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of the prophet is with me. Elijah confronted the prophet of Bar. He said, if I be a man of God, let fire fall. Do you know what the prophet of Bar was? Let me give you that own context. The prophet of Bar were like Shungo worshippers. Part of their worship was to be calling them fire because that's what Shungo worshippers do. It's part of their worship. Elijah came and said, let me tell you something. He took the battles to their field. He said, should we are good in calling them fire? That's what you should do. He said, call them fire. He said, the first thing I will do is that I will paralyze your spiritual power and make your, make your God dumb. So much so that you will not be to call on fire. He said, and the fire you cannot call, I will call it down for you. Ah, the brother of us said, ah, to call on fire, that's our expertise. Oh yeah, let's call it. Hey, hey. For morning, Elijah will come in the afternoon and say, hey, he has not answered you. Maybe your God has traveled. Oh. Maybe your God is asleep. Oh. Hey, maybe he's at the visa embassy. Oh. He was saying all this thing. Remember, Elijah has not called on fire himself. But just his confidence in the power of God. Elijah himself had not caught that fire. Just his confidence in the power of God. Who? When the time came, he said, put the sacrifice there. He said, take water, put water there. In case they say that I lighted fire from under. He said, take water, put water there again. Take water, put water there. And he said, let the Lord that answer by fire. Before he finished talking, fire consumed the sacrifice. The Bible said the fire leaked up the water. When he licked up the water, he says, hold the first prophet, deal with them. Ah, when he had caught that fire, you will not hold them before he caused that fire on you too. The, what, you need to do things in life that your friend will say that, I know God answers your prayer. And that will be the way you start testifying. They'll be like, ah, no, 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 no. You know, not, not, not the case that I saw in your office, I will show you. You say, ah, they say, I will show you. You'll be like, ah, Auntie, it's not that tough. Oh. Ah, I was just playing with you. I know I'm wrong. I'm apologizing right now. Ah, Auntie, if it's, it's actually, you kneel down and start begging. Because the last person she showed, the daughter ran mad. And you're afraid. When someone says you will show me, say, ah, please come. I want to give you in some ingredients to show me. My first name is this. My middle name is this. My last name is this. This is my mother's name. This is my father's name. In case you need it for the showing. He said, what else do you need? You give them everything. Just let me tell you before you start that no weapon fashioned against me shall prosper. It's not what the pastor said. It's a revelation in my spirit. Oh my God. That's what the pastor said. That's what is what revelation in your spirit. He said, no weapon fashioned against me shall prosper. Every tongue that rise against me shall be condemned. The Bible says, as they travel from nation to nation to place to place, he suffered no harm, no man to do the harm, saying, touch not my anointed and do my prophet no harm. The Bible says in the book of Exodus, he said, there's no enchantment against Jacob, neither is there any divination against Israel. He says, associate yourself together, ye shall be broken in pieces. He said, bind yourself together, you shall be grounded into powder. It's a man of encounter that talks like that. Are you ready? You need an encounter. That's why this fasting and prayer, go for encounters, sir. If you have not fasted before, start now. This one press. Encounter should be your major prayer. I will never forget in my life. My final year in the university, I was pastoring. One of our members had gotten born again. He was in one cult. I don't want to mention the name. And the Capone said, even if you get born again, you must be our member. He said, no, I can't be your member. I'm not born again. They came to tell me. I mean, I was tiny. As he came to tell me, anger. This is where you have anger arose in me. I said, get up. The guy said, get up. I said, we're going to his room now. He said, to, to the Capone's room. They have gone. They have cut last. I just carried my Bible. That's all I carried. I just carried my Bible. I said, march. Da, 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 da. As I go to him, I said, step back. I did realize, sorry. I said, step back. 
I got on the door. I banged this like a soldier. Da, 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 da. So the woman walk him. We are not on the defensive or on the offensive. This is a grief for nothing. Praise God. I, I banged the door. Pa, 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 pa. The court guy came out. I said, they told me they can pause him. I said, why is he right now? They said, eh, that is not around. I said, I told him who I am. I said, I come to you in the name of the Lord. I said, leave my people so that I will leave your people. Touch him. Heaven will touch you. The guy said, I'll deliver your message. That was how the guy came out of the court. It's not every pastor that can say that to. As they're talking, they will slap them. You know what? Praise God. Someone says, why, why, why didn't I think they would slap me? The fear was not in me. You know why it could not slap me? Because as I came, I came with divine presence. When you come with that presence, everybody is totally subdued. They will just be paralyzed. They are totally subdued. They asked Bishop Bessinda Osa. The court gave a ruling against him. So he, he had never gone to the court, so he now came to the court. When he got to the court, he asked him, he looked at the judge. He said, are you the one that ruled against me? The judge changed it. The judge changed it. The reason why is that as he spoke, the, it's called anakazo. That's the grief. It's called compelling power. It's called compelling power of the Holy Ghost overwhelm the judge. Listen to me. We are not here for religion, no. The reason why people don't have encounters is this. They are satisfied with theology. People don't have encounters because they are satisfied with what? Theology. Oh, no, 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 no. Listen to me. Knowing the word should lead you to the God of the word. I want to change levels. There are things the apostles did I need to do. Listen to me. Do you, you read the Bible? Act chapter 12. The Bible says, watch this now. Peter was in chains. Two soldiers held him on the right and on the left in chains. Let me see them. And the angel said, arise. As the angel said, arise. Do you know what the Bible says? The Bible says, and the chains fell off. You will possess power. You say, income, come. It flows. Why do you say, arise and chain fell off? I hope you know chain is metal. Chain is not real. It's metal. The soldiers were still sleeping. The chains fell off. There's a way to walk in authority. As you speak, contracts will flow. All about you beg and beg and beg. They rob you, rob you, rob you, rob you. They don't get anything. Praise God. Stand up, let's pray.